everyone. I welcome you to another lecture, which is uh, part of the course Writings on the Margins. And today's lecture is titled Text of Talit Autobiography, Om Prakash Valmiki's Juthan, which was written in 1997. So in the previous lecture, we were discussing about the autobiography as a, a form and also particularly how Dalit autobiography uh, has its unique features, right? Now, in this lecture, we will take a text and try to understand this genre still more. Now, Om Prakash Valmiki's Jutan was actually published in Hindi in 1997. And it's a narrative of the life experience of scavengers from North India, who are also referred to um, uh, with the terms churas or bhangis. Uh, so what we see that this text engages with life of Om Prakash Valmiki, it brings to the fore the context of uh, caste marginality in post-independence India. So even as, uh, you know, untouchability is believed to have been abolished uh, by around 1949, uh, which is two years after independence, yet, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the, the social mores um, it did not really, um, uh, you know, change um, in that sense. And uh, the, the, uh, the attitude of uh, uh, discrimination, exclusion continued to remain in uh, people's mind. And it continued to, uh, you know, also color people's uh, perspective of the, uh, of, uh, of the people belonging to the uh, lower castes. Right. So this text by Om, um, uh, by Om Prakash Valmiki then uh, engages with this reality and it's set in the uh, 1950s of India. Right. Now, if you look at the name of the author, that is uh, Valmiki, uh, it was also, an, I mean, uh, it, was, it was actually a name which was given to the uh, scavenger community, right, uh, uh, in the uh, uh, northern India. Uh, but what is of importance to us? is that what is the writer doing, um, you know, uh, and, and how is the writer uh, presenting his life story in this text and, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, raising some very important questions. Now, if we first look at the title itself, uh, the term Jutan is actually, uh, it, it, uh, it's, a, it's a Hindi word, which translates roughly into uh, leftovers from another's plate, okay? So uh, it refers to the food which is uh, left over uh, when somebody uh, doesn't, you know, kind of finish the meal, right? So whatever is remaining, whatever is left over is called as Jutan. And then in this text, it's Jutan becomes a metaphor for the subhuman status that the scavengers were reduced to in the Indian villages. So hence the title itself is, uh, you know, uh, uh, opens up a very important um, aspect of reality that Om Prakash Valmiki engages with in the text. Now the narrative, uh, you see, begins in 1955 with the author's recollection of his days in the scavenger's settlement. Now you might wonder that what do we mean by scavenger's settlement? Um, in those days, uh, the areas assigned to the lower castes or the areas where the lower castes would live were very uh, decisively separated, segregated from the other, uh, uh, you know, settlements. So, and this text then brings out this reality of the scavengers settlement because that's where Om Prakash Valmiki grew up in, okay. So that's where uh, the text is uh, situated. Now the settlement, this settlement, which was the scavenger settlement was, uh, uh, you know, uh, divided from the, so to say, purer upper caste homes by a pond. Uh, the other thing that we also notice, so, you know, uh, when, we, when we see this kind of a geographical, uh, so to say, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, separation, it also, tells us about how there was this kind of a segregation, not just on the outside, but also in people's mind as well. That how those belonging to the lower castes then 
were uh, considered to be inferior, were considered to be, so to say, impure, and therefore, uh, you know, the need, according to uh, uh, the uh, understanding at that time, to, uh, uh, you know, um, to uh, keep them uh, segregated. Now, this, of course, is a problematic reality that the text reflects on. We also see that uh, Om Prakash Valmiki in this text talks about his family's exploitation by the landed gentry. Now, this was another, uh, uh, you know, reality whereby the lower castes were not just segregated, but, uh, but they were also, you know, in that sense, um, uh, uh, mistreated by those which, who had the lands. So uh, uh, people from these castes would be working on the uh, farms, on the lands of the landowners, and the treatment that they were meted out, or the, or the, or the treatment that they um, underwent was also very, very questionable. This is another point of engagement of Valmiki's text, right? Uh, the third uh, uh, important point of engagement is whereby he talks about segregation, not just in terms of, uh, you know, the scavengers settlement, which was, uh, you know, separated from the upper caste homes by a pond, but there was also segregation from his upper caste fellow students in the village school as well. So this becomes a very important aspect that how this uh, element of uh, uh, differentiation was almost all pervasive. Every aspect of life, uh, it was as if the person was reminded that they did not belong to the society or they did not belong, so to say, to the accepted uh, part of society, right? Now, there is a quotation from the text that we must look at and it will help us uh, put in perspective that how the schools also uh, that um, Om Prakash Valmiki went to had this kind of reality. Now, he says uh, uh, in the text, and I'll quote, uh, the country had become independent eight years ago. Gandhi's uplifting of the untouchables was resounding everywhere. Although the doors of the government schools had begun to open for the untouchables, the mentality of the ordinary people had not changed much. I had to sit away from the others in the class, that too on the floor. The mat ran out before reaching the spot I sat on. Sometimes I would have to sit away behind everybody right near the door." Unquote. Now you see, in this little excerpt, what do we see? The narrator is establishing the context that it's eight years since the country's independence. It's also a time when, um, you know, Mahatma Gandhi uh, uh, had been working relentlessly uh, for uplifting uh, the untouchables and his ideas were resounding everywhere. He said that even the government schools had been opened up finally for the untouchables, right? Where, uh, uh, of course, education then becomes a very important part. But he says that the mentality of the ordinary people had not changed much. So while there were these, um, if one can call it that, institutional changes, but those changes were yet to percolate down to people's mindset or as he refers to as mentality. So he says that I had to sit away from the others in the class because he belonged to the untouchable, so to say, uh, uh, caste. So he was not allowed to mingle with the other children. Even as with the new, um, uh, you know, um, uh, provisions, uh, the, un uh, the, the children of the untouchable were going to school. They had started to get education, to get access to education. But the conditions in the school then continue to reflect the same reality, where they were discriminated against. They were, uh, you know, kind of um, even physically asked to, um, you know, uh, sit separate and that uh, impacted them deeply, right? Now, you might wonder that we've been constantly talking about the idea of segregation, separation, physical distance. Why was that a practice when it came to uh, caste marginality? This brings us to the point of 
um, uh, or, or, or to the idea of purity and pollution. And this is a theme which we also notice um, which resounds in the text. You see now, uh, this idea of purity and pollution actually marked a deep chasm between, or a, or a deep gap between the touchability and untouchability in the subcontinent's caste hierarchy. So those who were, uh, you know, considered to be, uh, or, or those who belonged to the lower castes were considered to be impure, considered to be untouchable, and thereby needed uh, to be segregated. Now in Valmiki's narrative in this uh, text, we see that, uh, you know, spoiled food or soiled food from the upper caste homes, which is destined for the garbage bin, it makes its way into the bare kitchens of these um, uh, marginalized. Now, this is a very, very moving account in that sense, that how food which is left over by a certain section of society would then reach the kitchens of these people. So what do we see? We very clearly notice that the shame and the degradation of relishing these leftovers as a child constantly haunts the narrator of this text for the rest of his life. He, of course, being the child, uh, does not have, you know, such, uh, such an in-depth understanding of social reality, but of course is a very, very sensitive observer. So, and noticing uh, uh, this reality, he felt a kind of shame. He felt a kind of humiliation. And that is, uh, you know, very, very evident in the narrative voice in the text itself, right? Uh, now, we see that how uh, Valmiki then brings alive such an experience, uh, not just, um, you know, uh, through the eyes of, uh, uh, of, the, of, of this young child who uh, desires education, etc., but also his parents, uh, you know, kind of uh, play a very important role uh, in the context. We see that uh, the mother's experience uh, also uh, plays a very uh, uh, has a has a very defining or a very decisive influence on him. Right now, there is this instance that we must um, uh, uh, from the text that we must uh, think of. Now that is when the, there's a moment when the narrator's mother uh, had labored very, very hard as a cleaner in the home of an upper caste. And um, this is a moment of uh, a feast um, which is going on. I think it's a, it's, it's a wedding feast. And at that moment, the narrator's mother demanded more than just the leftovers from the wedding feast for her children, all right? And at that moment, the reply that she got is something which is incredibly painful. Uh, the, the person says, and I quote, you are taking a basket full of jutan, and on top of that, you want food for your children. Don't forget your place. Pick up your basket and get going, unquote. Now you see, look at the uh, attitude. The person said that you're already taking a basket full of jutan. So which means what? That he says that you already have enough of the leftover with you. And now, on top of that, you also want actual food for your children. Just get going. And the, these words, for don't forget your place, again echo this kind of um, you know, attitude that Valmiki talks about, uh, whereby people continued to discriminate against the lower caste, continued to, uh, you know, um, uh, segregate them, continued to look at them uh, as inferior in that sense, right? And their attitude towards uh, these people was full of, um, uh, you know, in that sense, um, uh, ridicule, right? So this reality is very, very poignantly uh, brought about uh, by Valmiki in his narrative, where he begins by talking about, you know, his experience at the school. Then also, of course, this instance that we talked about um, 
which was uh, uh, experienced by his mother. So we notice that how the mother does not just become, uh, you know, a means for the child to, um, uh, to, uh, to, to, to come still closely face to face with this kind of a reality, but at the same time, the mother instilled in her children the discipline to resist upper caste leftovers, no matter how hungry they were. You see, now this is a kind of assertion now that we are beginning to locate. Of course, there are f further uh, uh, other events of discrimination as well. We looked at the reference to uh, his uh, treatment at the, at the school. Now we looked at the treatment of his mother, um, uh, you know, where she was uh, very, um, uh, in, a, in, in a very derogatory way, asked to leave and not forget her place. But all this, you know, Valmiki also shows, led to this kind of a feeling of um, the need to assert themselves. So therefore, you see, the mother then instilled in her children that discipline that no matter how hungry they were, they should resist the leftovers. And this one incident marks then the start of the narrator's transformation from a little, um, uh, you know, outcast boy reconciled to assuaging his hunger from the upper caste leftovers to a battler, a one who would struggle against the scourge of untouchability. So you see, this then lays the foundation of this very important transformation then which is crucial to the text. So we notice that how this uh, text not only recounts um, uh, these experiences of, uh, which are humiliating, uh, experiences which uh, you know, echo uh, uh, you know, this kind of a, uh, a discrimination, but at the same time, there is a very um, uh, you know, decisive assertion of uh, their identity an assertion of the will to transform and to, and to transcend this reality. And that is what is, uh, you know, also a very, very interesting part of this autobiography um, of uh, Valmiki. Now, you see, we see that how the novel then uh, carries a narration of the painful stages of evolution of an untouchable to an educated writer, an activist and a professional in modern India. So there's this entire trajectory that one notices from uh, the painful initial uh, uh, times to uh, his uh, development uh, uh, into an educated, um, uh, you know, um, a writer, activist and a professional in modern India. But if we, uh, you know, kind of um, uh, look at the text still more closely, another thing that uh, comes to mind is this idea of uh, you know the discrepancy, particularly when we when, when we look at those parts where uh, he is recounting his um, uh, you know difficult experiences because of his caste, we notice here that there is a uh, uh, discrepancy between the promises of a secular state and the reality that actually unfolded. Now let's not forget, as we pointed out, that this text is uh, situated in the fifties, a time when India had just become independent. Everyone was full of dreams. Uh, it was a hard fought um, struggle for independence. Those who uh, you know, uh, fought uh, had imagined a country of uh, uh, equality, uh, which, would, uh, which would bring prosperity. Everyone would have a fair share. So of course, those were the ideals that had informed the struggle. But this text points to the fact that how certain gaps still remained. Certain social practices um, continued even after India became independent and they needed uh, uh, to be looked into. Uh, it was important to pay attention to them, right? So this aspect of the, of the, of the discrepancy then between the promises or the dreams of the post-independent India and the reality is, uh, becomes a crucial um, uh, you know, uh, a point uh, uh, for uh, understanding what Valmiki says in the text. Right? Now, here of course, uh, as we also mentioned, that how education then becomes uh, very, very uh, important. 
so education is one thing that is 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 considered to be the basic right or is uh, or, or or should be a basic right of each individual in a free society in a free country but we notice in this text how the disadvantage of his so to say polluted caste in that sense rarely leaves the narrator a choice for acquiring education on equal grounds we saw uh, uh, through the quotation just a while ago that how he was um, uh, you know uh, mistreated he was um, asked to sit away he was uh, not allowed to interact with others so education even as it was there but at the same time in what conditions is the question that the author seems to be asking and we see that how in the portions where the novel deals with his with the narrator's um, you know a days of school we uh, there's a mention of uh, the fact that how he is also made to sweep the school grounds while the upper caste children uh, would be in their classrooms right a lot of times so so this kind of a violence then we notice um is is also has has a very strong psychological dimension the the little boy would feel incredibly humiliated when he would be asked to sweep the grounds while others would study in the classrooms right but you see now this violence is not just psychological but also physical the novel very clearly shows that how he was also caned or he was uh, you know kind of flogged at the slightest provocation by the teacher why because he belonged to a lower caste so we see that how these dif these different conditions even at school uh, did not make education an easy task for him and it then uh, highlights this gap which continued to remain in the post independent india as well the next aspect that we notice uh, uh, which valmiki talks about is the idea of labor where he talks about that how his family members were often not paid for their labor and then they were mercilessly beaten up by the police for asserting their right to wages now imagine the very basic uh, uh, you know uh, a demand that is you are paid for the work you do but again because they belonged to the lower caste their social caste marginality also filtered into this kind of a uh, economic if you can call it that um, a disparity as well where they were not given uh, uh, money for the work that they did so there is uh, you know a discrimination even on this account where they were not uh, rewarded for the work they did so not just in society in terms of segregation not just in education but even uh, you know uh, through the idea of labor we see the difficulties that the uh, uh, narrator faced now let's uh, uh, look at this very important quote which uh, brings out the point of labor and also tells us about the writers or in that sense uh, the narrators uh, of um, uh, psychological framework he says why is it a crime to ask for the price of one's labor those who keep singing the glories of democracy use the machinery to quell the blood flowing in our veins as though we are not citizens of this country unquote now this quote is very very powerful where he is questioning so you see constantly there's this discourse of subjugation and questioning which coexists so while on the one hand there is an unequal treatment on the other there is a very vehement questioning of it as well and that forms the crux of the aesthetic of the autobiography as well so he says that is it a crime to ask for one's uh, 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 you know a price for one's labor and those who sing glories of the newly found country or the uh, or, the, or so, so, so to say the newly independent country they are the ones who uh, you know um, uh, who 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 give us this kind of a treatment and he says that are we not equally a part of this country so this questioning then is uh, crucial to 
this narrative that he brings out. The other strand that one notices in the text is that we see that there are two attitudes of the uh, uh, people belonging to the lower caste, right? One, of course, we've said that, you know, uh, uh, by means of talking about humiliation, by means of uh, talking about the dear, difficult reality, uh, there is a kind of an assertion against it. But you see, at the same time, not everybody um, had that attitude. And Valmiki uh, 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 narrates about this, uh, I mean, you know, like this, uh, this becomes evident in, um, uh, in a, a situation in the text where uh, Valmiki narrates a clash with his niece Seema, who refuses to introduce him to her college mates. And let's look at the uh, words of this character. You may, f you may be able to face it, his niece says def defensively. I cannot. What is the point of going around with the drum of caste tied around your neck?" Unquote. Now over here, what do we see? We see that there is a kind of an evasive attitude on the part of Seema, who does not want to acknowledge her caste. And there is some kind of a, uh, you know, um, uh, one can say, uh, this uh, uh, hesitation to acknowledge it. So, in fact, this kind of a hesitation verges onto a denial of realities of a fractured social order. So, as if this kind of, uh, you know, one's caste did not play up uh, uh, against uh, oneself. So, it's a kind of a denial of such a fractured social order. So, this is one attitude right, of the people from the community. And of course, there is this alternate attitude as well. And what is this alternate attitude? In such a context, the mark of an evolved self is what? The courage to confront, the courage to face the cruelties of such a social order by resting and facing such uh, a, a social order on one's own terms. So these two are the opposite attitudes which the writer brings out in the text and very clearly this uh, distinction between Seema's response and the narrator's response to the social reality uh, tells us about the two opposite attitudes. Right Now we see that Valmiki's life narrative uh, uh, here in Juton through a stubborn will to educate oneself and actively partake of the uh, legacy of the Dalit leader B.R. Ambedkar's fight for Dalit empowerment during the critical decades of the 1930s and 40s. So this is something which his narrative averts, that there is a stubborn will that one notices on part of Valmiki to educate himself and actively participate in the empowerment of the Dalits that was actually very critical in India during the 30s and the 40s. And we see that how, you know, um, in the text, um, both the mother as well as the father of uh, Valmiki play a very crucial role in this, um, in this kind of uh, assertion. The mother, when she, uh, you know, faced that incident at the wedding feast, told the child to no longer accept the leftovers and go hungry but not accept the leftovers. On the other hand, we also notice in the text a very strong position taken by the father, where the father tries his best to get him ad uh, admission in a school so that he gets education and uplifts himself from this condition of marginality. So we see that how in this text of Juton, both the strands coexist. So it brings alive the social reality of uh, which, uh, which, which worked against um, uh, the uh, socially marginalized, but at the same time, there is a very strong assertion, a very strong will to, uh, you know, uh, 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 to, uh, to kind of bring a new reality 
that would be based on equality to uplift oneself, to empower oneself by means of education. So that becomes a very important uh, feature of this text. Now, as you notice, uh, as, you, as, as you read this text, you will come across these themes of purity and pollution, the idea of education, the idea of labor, the idea of uh, you know, discrimination, and of course, this uh, a counter discourse of assertion and empowerment as well. Thank you.